Space Elevator from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. Introduction. A space elevator is a hypothetical structure designed to transport material from a planet's surface into space. Many different types of space elevator structures have been proposed. They all share the goal of replacing rocket propulsion with the traversal of a fixed structure via a mechanism not unlike an elevator in order to move material into or beyond orbit. Space elevators have also sometimes been referred to as beanstalks, space bridges, space lifts, space ladders, or orbital towers. The most common proposal is a tether, usually in the form of a cable or a ribbon, that spans from the surface of, to a point beyond geosynchronous orbit. As the planet rotates, the inertia at the end of the tether counteracts gravity and keeps the tether taut. Vehicles can then climb the tether and escape the planet's gravity without the use of rockets. Such a structure could eventually permit delivery of great quantities of cargo and people to orbit, at costs only a fraction of those associated with current means. Section 1. Non-Tether Space Elevator Concepts At this time, orbital tethers are the only space elevator concept that is the subject of active research and commercial interest in space. However, there are two related concepts worth mentioning, a space fountain and a very tall, compressive structure, i.e. a structure that stands on its own. A space fountain would use pellets fired up from the ground by a mass driver, the pellets traveling through the center of a tower. These pellets would impart their kinetic energy to the tower structure via electromagnetic drag as they traveled up and again as their direction was reversed by a magnetic field at the top. Thus, the structure would not be supported by the compressive strength of its materials and could be hundreds of kilometers high. Unlike tethered space elevators, which have to be placed near the equator, a space fountain could be located at any latitude. Space fountains would require a continuous supply of power to maintain a loft. Compressive structures would be similar to those used for aerial masts. While these structures might reach the agreed altitude for space, 100 kilometers, they are unlikely to reach geostationary orbit of 35,786 kilometers. Due to the difference between suborbital and orbital space flights, additional rockets or other means of propulsion would be necessary to achieve orbital speed. Section 2. Orbital Tethers This concept, also called orbital space elevator, geosynchronous orbital tether, or beanstalk, is a subset of the skyhook concept. Construction would be a vast project. A tether would have to be built of a material that could endure tremendous stress while also being lightweight, cost-effective, and manufacturable in great quantities. Today's materials technology does not quite meet these requirements. A considerable number of other novel engineering problems would also have to be solved to make a space elevator practical. Not all problems regarding feasibility have yet been addressed. Nevertheless, some believe that the necess necessary technology might be developed as early as 2008, and the first space elevator could be operational by 2018. Section 3. Physics and Structure There are a variety of tether designs. Almost every design includes a base station, a cable, climbers, and a counterweight. 3.1. Base Station The base station designs typically fall into two categories mobile and stationary. Mobile stations are typically large, ongoing vessels, although airborne stations have been proposed as well. Stationary platforms are generally located in high-altitude locations, such as on the top of high towers. Mobile platforms have the advantage of being able to maneuver to avoid high winds, storms, and space debris. While stationary platforms don't have this, they typically have access to cheaper and more reliable power sources and require a shorter cable. While the decrease in cable length may seem minimal, typically no more than a few kilometers, that can significantly reduce the minimal width of the cable at the center, and reduce the minimal length of the cable reaching beyond geostationary orbit significantly. 3.2 Cable The cable must be made of a material with an extremely high tensile strength to density ratio. The stress a material can be subjected to without breaking divided by its density. A space elevator can be made relatively economically feasible if a cable with a density similar to graphite and a tensile strength of about 65 
to 120 gigapascals can be produced in a bulk reasonable price. By comparison, most steel has a tensile strength of under 1 gigapascal, and the strongest steels no more than 5. But steel is heavy. M much lighter material would be Kevlar, which has a tensile strength of 2.6 to 4.1 gigapascals, while quartz fiber can reach upwards of 20 gigapascals. The tensile strength of diamond fi filaments would be theoretically only minimally higher. Carmen nanotubes appear to have a theoretical tensile strength and density that is well above the desired minimum for space elevator structures. The technology to manufacture bulk quantities of this material and fabricate them into a cable is in its early stages of development. While theoretically carbon nanotubes can have tensile strengths well beyond 120 gigapascals, in practice the highest tensile strength ever observed in a single walled tube is 52 gigapascals and such tubes averaged breaking between 30 and 50 gigapascals. Even the strongest fiber made of nanotubes is likely to have not noticeably less strength than its components. Improving tensile strength depends on further research on purity and different types of nanotubes. Most designs call for single-walled carbon nanotubes. While multi-walled nanotubes may attain higher tensile strengths, they have disproportionately higher mass and are consequently poor choices for building the cable. One potential material possibility is to take advantage of the high pressure interlinking properties of carbon nanotubes of a single variety. While this would cause the tubes to lose some tensile strength, by trading the sp2 bond graphite nanotubes for sp3 diamond, it will enable them to be held together in a single fiber by more than the usual weak van der Waals forces and allow manufacturing of a fiber of any length. The technology to spin regular VDW bonded yarn from the carbon nanotubes is just in its infancy. The first success to spin a long yarn as opposed to pieces of only a few centimeters has been reported only very recently, March of 2004. But the strength to rate ratio was not as good as Kevlar due to the inconsistent quality and short length of the tubes being held together by VDW. Note that as of 2006, carbon nanotubes have an approximate price of $25 per gram, and 20 million grams would be necessary to form even a seed elevator. This price is decreasing rapidly, and large-scale production would reduce it further, but the price of suitable carbon nanotube cable is anyone's guess at this time. Carbon nanotube fiber is an area of energetic worldwide research because the applications go much further than space elevators. Other suggested application areas include suspension bridges, new composite materials, lighter aircraft and rockets, computer processor interconnects, and so on. This is good for space elevators because it is likely to push down the price of the cable material in the future. 3.2.1 Cable taper. Due to its enormous length, a space elevator cable must be carefully designed to carry its own weight, as well as the weight of smaller climbers. The required strength of the cable will vary along its length, since at various points it has to carry the weight of the cable below, or provide a centripetal force to retain the cable and counterweight above. In an ideal cable, the actual strength of the cable at any given point would be no greater than the required strength at that point plus a safety margin. This implies a tapered design. Using a model that takes into account the Earth's gravitational and centrifugal forces and neglecting the smaller solar and lunar effects, it is possible to show that the cross-sectional area of the cable as a function of height is given by the following equation. A as a function of R equals A naught times the exponent of rho over S times the quantity one half omega squared times r naught squared minus r squared plus g naught times r naught times the quantity one minus r naught over r, where a of r is the cross sectional area as a function of distance r from Earth's center. The constants in the previous equation are a naught is the cross sectional area of the cable on the Earth's surface, rho is the density of the material that the cable is made out of. S is the tensile strength of the material. Omega is the rotational frequency of the Earth about its axis, 
7.292 times 10 to the negative fifth radians per second. R0 is the distance between the Earth's center and the base of the cable. It is approximately the Earth's equatorial radius, 6,378 kilometers. G0 is the acceleration due to gravity at the cable's base, 9.780 meters per second squared. This equation gives a shape where the cable thickness initially increases rapidly in an exponential fashion, but slows at an altitude a few times the Earth's radius, and then gradually becomes a parallel when it finally reaches maximum thickness at geostationary orbit. The cable thickness then decreases again out from geosynchronous orbit. Thus, the taper of the cable from base to geo, r equals 42,000, 164 kilometers is given by the following equation. A as a function of RGO over A naught is equal to the exponent of rho over S times 4.832 times 10 to the seventh meters squared per second squared, using the density and tensile strength of steel, and assuming a diameter of one centimeter at ground level yields a diameter of several hundred kilometers at station, geostationary orbit height showing that steel, and indeed most materials used in present-day engineering, are unsuitable for building a space elevator. The equation shows us that there are four ways of achieving a more reasonable thickness at geostationary orbit. 1. Using a lower density material. Not much scope for improvement as the range of densities of most solids that come into question is rather narrow, somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 kilograms per square meter. 2. Using a higher strength material. This is the area where most of the research is focused. Carbon nanotubes are ten times stronger than the strongest types of steel, hugely reducing the cable's cross-sectional area at geostationary orbit. 3. Increasing the height of a tip of the base station, where the base of the cable is attached. The exponential relationship means a small increase in the base height results in a large decrease in thickness at geostationary level. Towers up to 100 kilometers high have been proposed. Not only would a tower of such height reduce the cable mass, it would also avoid exposure of the cable to atmospheric processes. 4. Making the cable as thin as possible at its base. It still has to be thick enough to carry a payload, however, so the minimum thickness at the base level also depends on tensile strength. A cable made of carbon nanotube would typically be just a millimeter wide at the base. 3.3 Climbers A space elevator cannot be an elevator in the typical sense, with moving cables, due to the need for the cable to be significantly wider at the center than the tips. While designs employing smaller, segmented moving cables along the length of the main cable have been proposed, most cable designs call for the elevator to climb up a stationary cable. Climbers cover a wide range of designs. On elevator designs whose cables are planar ribbons, some have proposed to use pairs of rollers to hold the cable with friction. Other climber designs involve moving arms containing pads of hooks, rollers with retracting hooks, magnetic levitation unlikely due to the bulky track required on the cable, and numerous other possibilities. Power is a significant obstacle for climbers. Energy storage densities, bearing significant advances in compact nuclear power, are unlikely to ever be able to store the energy for an entire climb in a single climber without making it way too much. Some potential solutions have involved laser or microwave power beaming and solar power. Other possible designs use energy from regenerative braking of down climbers, passing energy to up climbers as they pass magnetosphere braking of the cable to dampen oscillations, tropospheric heat differentials in the cable, ionospheric discharge through the cable, and other concepts. The primary power methods, laser and microwave power beaming, have significant problems with both efficiency and heat dissipation on both sides. Although with optimistic numbers for the future technologies, they may be feasible. Climbers must be paced at optimal timings so as to minimize cable stress and oscillations and to maximize throughput. The weakest point of the cable is near its planetary connection. New climbers can typically be launched so long as there are not multiple climbers in this area at once. An only up elevator can handle a higher throughput, 
but has the disadvantage of not allowing energy recapture through regener regenerative down climbers. Additionally, an up-only elevator would require some other method to return people to Earth. Finally, only up climbers that don't return to Earth must be disposable. If used, they should be modular so that their components can be used for other purposes in space. In any case, smaller climbers have the disadvantage over lar larger climbers of giving better options for how to pace trips up the cable, but may impose technological limitations. 3.4 Counterweight There have been two dominant methods proposed for dealing with the counterweighting need. A heavy object, such as a captured asteroid positioned past geosynchronous orbit, or extending the cable itself well past geosynchronous orbit. The latter idea has gained more support in recent years due to the relative simplicity of the task and the fact that a payload that went to the end of the counterweight cable would acquire considerable velocity relative to the Earth, allowing it to be launched into interplanetary space. 3.5 Angular Momentum, Speed, and Cable Lean The horizontal speed of each part of the cable increases with altitude, proportional to the distance from the center of the Earth reaching orbital velocity at geosynchronous orbit. Therefore, as a payload is lifted up a space elevator, it needs to gain not only altitude, but angular momentum, horizontal speed, as well. This angular momentum is taken from Earth's own rotation. As the climber ascends, it is initially moving slightly more slowly than the cable that it moves onto, the Coriolis effect, and thus the climber drags on the cable carrying the cable with it very slightly to the west. At 200 km an hour climb speed, it can be shown that this generates a 1 degree lean on the cable. The horizontal component of the tension in the non-vertical cable applies a sideways pull to the payload, accelerating it eastward, and this is the source of the speed that the climber needs. Conversely, the cable pulls westward on Earth's surface, insignificantly slowing down the Earth from Newton's third law. Meanwhile, the overall effect of the centrifugal force acting on the cable causes it to constantly try to return to the energetically favorable vertical orientation, so a stable angle is set up, provided that the space elevator is designed so that the center of mass is always stays above geosynchronous orbit for the maximum climb speed of the climbers, the elevator cannot fall over. By the time the payload has reached geo, the angular momentum, horizontal speed, is enough that the payload is in orbit. The opposite process would occur for payloads descending the elevator, tilting the cable eastwards and insignificantly increasing Earth's rotation speed. 3.6 Launching into Outer Space We can determine the velocities that might be attained at the end of Pearson's 144,000 km tower or cable. At the end of the tower, the tangential velocity is 10.93 km per second which is more than enough to escape Earth's gravitational field and send probes as far out as Saturn. If an object were allowed to slide freely along the upper part of the tower, a velocity high enough to escape the solar system entirely would be attained. This is accomplished by trading off overall angular momentum of the tower and Earth for a velocity of the launch object, in much the same way one snaps a towel or throws a lacrosse ball. For higher velocities, the cargo can be electromagnetically accelerated, or the cable could be extended, although that would require additional strength in the cable. 3.7 Extraterrestrial Elevators A space elevator could also be constructed on some other planets, asteroids or moons. A Martian tether could be much shorter than an Earth one. Mars' surface gravity is 38% of Earth's, while it rotates around its axis in about the same time as Earth. Because of this, Martian aerostationary orbit is much closer to the surface, and hence the elevator would be much shorter. Exotic materials might not be required to construct such an elevator. However, building a Martian elevator would be a unique challenge because the Martian moon Phoebos is in low orbit and interacts with the equator regularly, twice every orbital period of 11 hours 6 minutes. A collision between the elevator and the 22.2 km diameter moon would have to be avoided through active steering of the elevator, or perhaps by moving the moon itself out of the area. One simpler way to resolve the problem of Phoebos, 1.1 degree orbital inclination, or Deimos, 1.8 degree orbital inclination, 
in her action is to position the tether and anchor perhaps five degrees off the Martian equator. There would be a small payload penalty, but the tether would pass outside the orbital incl inclination of the two moons. Also, the tether would depart the Martian anchor at five to ten degrees from the vertical. Conversely, a Venusian space elevator would need to be much longer. Although a tether placed at stationary orbit of the slowly rotating Venus would intersect the Sun, one could be constructed that rotated with the fast-moving cloud of decks of the planet, which only take four Earth days to make a complete cycle. The cable would need to exceed 100,000 kilometers long, but, counterintuitively, it would experience less stress due to the slightly smaller gravity exerted on the cable. Such an elevator could serve as aerostats or floating cities in the benign regions of the atmosphere. A lunar space elevator would need to be very long, more than twice the length of an Earth elevator, but due to the low gravity of the moon, it can be made of existing engineering materials. Alternatively, due to the lack of atmosphere on the moon, a rotating tether could be used with its center of mass in orbit around the moon with a counterweight at the short end and a payload at the long end. The path of the payload would be an epicycloid around the moon, touching down at some integer number of times per orbit. Thus, payloads are lifted off the surface of the moon and flung away at the high point of the orbit. Rapidly spinning asteroids or moons could use cables to eject materials in order to move the materials to convenient points, such as Earth orbits, or conversely, to eject materials in order to send the bulk of the mass of the asteroid or moon to Earth orbit or Lagrangian point. This was suggested by Russell Johnston in the 1980s. Freeman Dyson, a physicist and mathematician, has suggested using such smaller systems as power generators at points distant from the Sun, where solar power is uneconomical. It may also be possible to construct space elevators at the three smaller gas giants, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These would all involve tapering several times greater than those of the inner solar system, and would need to be approximately 50 to 60,000 kilometers long, yet are still within the limits of advanced nanotubes. These outer space elevators could facilitate the exchange of supplies and helium-3 between floating mining colonies in the atmospheres and local moon settlements. However, difficulties such as the equatorially orbiting lower rings and moons of these gas giant planets would first need to be overcome. Section 4. Construction The construction of a space elevator would be a vast project, requiring advances in engineering and physical technology. NASA has identified five key technologies for future space elevator development. 1. Material for cable, for example, carbon nanotube and nanotechnology, and for the tower. 2. Tether deployment and control. 3. Tall tower construction. 4 electromagnetic propulsion, for example, magnetic levitation. 5. Space infrastructure and the development of space industry and economy. Two different ways to deploy a space elevator have been proposed. 4.1. Traditional way. One early plan involved lifting the entire mass of the elevator into geosynchronous orbit and simultaneously lowering one cable downwards towards the Earth's surface while another cable is deployed upwards directly away from the Earth's surface. Tidal forces, gravity, and centrifugal force would naturally pull the cables directly towards and away from the Earth and keep the elevator balanced around geosynchronous orbit. However, this approach requires the lifting of hundreds or even thousands of tons on conventional rockets. This would be very expensive. 4.2 Brad Edwards Proposal Bradley C. Edwards former director of research for the Institute for Scientific Research, ISR, based in Fairmont, West Virginia, is a leading authority on the space elevator concept. His designs contrast with previous designs by presenting a plausible scheme showing how a space elevator could be built in little more than a decade, rather than far in the future. He proposes that a single, hair-like 18 metric ton, 20 short ton, seed cable be deployed in the traditional way giving a very lightweight elevator with very little lifting capacity. Then, progressively heavier cables would be pulled up from the ground along it, repeatedly, repeatedly strengthening it until the elevator reaches the required mass and strength. 
This is much the same technique used to build suspension bridges. Although 18 tons for a seed cable may sound like a lot, it would actually be very lightweight. The proposed average mass is about 0.2 kilogram per kilometer. Conventional copper telephone wires running to consumer homes weigh about 4 kilograms per kilometer. This is the method described by Sir Arthur C. Clarke in his novel, The Foundations of Paradise. 4.3 Other Designs These are far less well developed and will be mentioned here only in passing. If the cable provides a useful tensile strength of about 62.5 gigapascals or above, then it turns out that a constant width cable can reach beyond geosynchronous orbit without breaking under its own weight. The far end can then be turned around and passed back to the Earth, forming a constant width loop. The two sides of the loop are naturally kept apart by Coriolis forces due to the rotation of the Earth and the cable. By exponentially increasing the thickness of the cable, from the ground a very quick buildup of new elevator may be performed. It helps that no active climbers are needed and the power is applied mechanically. However, because the loop runs at a constant speed, joining and leaving the loop may be somewhat challenging, and the strength of the loop is lower than a conventional tapered design, reducing the maximum payload that can be carried without snapping the cable. Other structures, such as mechanically linked multiple loop designs hanging off a central exponential tether might also be practical and would seem to avoid the laser powering beaming. This design has higher capacity than a single loop, but still requires perhaps twice as much tether material. Section 5. Failure Modes, Safety Issues, and Construction Difficulties As with any structure, there are a number of ways in which things could go wrong. A space elevator would present a considerable navigational hazard, both to aircraft and spacecraft. Aircraft could be dealt with by means of simple air traffic control restrictions, but impacts by space objects, in particular by meteoroids and micrometeorites, pose a more difficult problem. 5.1. Satellites If nothing were done, essentially all the satellites with perigees below the top of the elevator will eventually collide. Twice per day, each orbital plane intersects the elevator, as the rotation of the Earth swings the cable around the equator. Usually the satellite and the cable will not line up. However, except for synchronized orbits, the elevator and satellite will eventually occupy the same place at the same time, almost certainly leading to structural failure of the space elevator and destruction of the satellite. Most active satellites are capable of some degree of orbital maneuvering and could avoid these predictable collisions, but inactive satellites and other orbiting debris would need to be either preemptively removed from orbit by garbage collectors or would need to be closely watched and nudged whenever their orbit approaches the elevator. The impulses required would be small, and need only be applied very infrequently. A laser broom system may be sufficient for this task. In addition, Brad Edwards' design actually allows the elevator to move out of the way, because the fixing point is at sea and mobile. Further, transverse oscillations of the cable could be controlled so as to ensure that the cable avoids satellites on known paths. The required amplitudes are modest relative to the cable length. 5.2 Meteoroids and Micrometeorites Meteoroids present a more difficult problem, since they would not be predictable and much less time would be available to detect and track them as they approach Earth. It is likely that a space elevator would still suffer impacts of some kind, no matter how carefully it is guarded. However, most space elevator designs call for the use of multiple parallel cables separated from each other by struts. With sufficient margin of safety, that severing just one or two strands still allows the surviving strands to hold the elevator's entire weight while repairs are performed. If the strands are properly arranged, no single impact would be able to sever enough of them to overwhelm the surviving strands. Far worse than meteoroids are micrometeorites, tiny, high-speed particles found in high concentrations at certain altitudes. Avoiding micrometeorites is essentially impossible, and they will ensure that strands of the elevator are continuously being cut. Most methods designed to deal with this involve a design similar to a Hoy tether, or a network of strands in a cylindrical or planar arrangement with two or more helical strands. Creating the cable as a mesh instead of a ribbon helps prevent collateral damage from each micrometeorite impact. It is not enough, however, that other fibers be able to take over the load of a failed strand. The system must also survive the immediate dynamical effects of fiber failure, 
which generates projectiles aimed at the cable itself. For example, if the cable has a working stress of 50 gigapascals and a Young's modulus of 1000 gigapascals, its strain will be 0.05 and its stored elastic energy will be 1 half times 0.05 times 50 gigapascals or 1.25 times 10 to the 9th joules per cubic meter. Breaking a fiber will result in a pair of detensioning waves moving apart at the speed of sound in the fiber, with the fiber segments behind each wave moving at over 1,000 meters per second, more than the muzzle velocity of an M16 rifle. Unless these fast-moving projectiles can be stopped safely, they will br break yet other fibers, initiating a failure cascade capable of severing the cable. The challenge of preventing fiber breakage from initiating a castor catastrophic failure cascade seems to be unaddressed in the current, as of January 2005, literature on terrestrial space elevators. Problems of this sort would be easier to solve in lower tension applications, such as lunar space elevators. 5.3. Corrosion. Corrosion is a major risk to any thinly built tether, which most designs call for. In the upper atmosphere, atomic oxygen steadily eats away at most materials. A tether will consequently need to be either made from corrosion-resistant material or have a corrosion-resistant coating, adding to the weight. Gold and platinum have been shown to be practically immune to atomic oxygen. Several more common materials, such as aluminum, are damaged very slowly and could be repaired as needed. 5.4. Material Defects Any structure as large as a space elevator will have massive numbers of tiny defects in the construction material. It has been suggested that, because large structures have more defects than small structures, that large structures are inherently weaker than small, giving an estimated carbon nanotube strength of only 30 gigapascals, which would be less than that needed to build a space elevator for a reasonable cost. 5.5. Weather. In the atmosphere, the risk factors of wind and lightning come into play. The basic mitigation is location. As long as the tether's anchor remains within two degrees of the equator, it will remain in the quiet zone between Earth's Hadley cells where there is relatively little violent weather. Remain remaining storms could be avoided by moving a floating anchor platform. The lightning risk can be minimized by using a non-conductive fiber with a water-resistant coating to prevent a conductive buildup from forming. The wind risk can be minimized by the use of a fiber with a small cross-sectional area that can rotate with the wind to res reduce resistance. Ice forming on the cable also presents a potential problem. It could add significantly to the cable's weight and affect the passage of elevator cars. Also, ice falling from the cable could damage elevator cars or possibly the elevator itself. One reasonably recent result is that high wind speeds can flatten the elevator cable horizontally across the surface of the earth, perhaps a hundred kilometers. Surprisingly, the stress on the cable is not significantly increased, since the elevator is tens of thousands of kilometers long, the percentage of increase is tiny, and no major damage is predicted. 5.6. Sabotage Sabotage is a relatively unquantifiable problem. A space elevator might prove an attractive target for a terrorist or other politically motivated attack. Concern over sabotage may have an effect on location, adding to the constraint of avoiding unstable territories to the existing requirement of an equatorial site. 5.7. Vibrational Harmonics A final risk of structural failure comes from the possibility of vibrational harmonics within the cable. Like the shorter and f more familiar strings of stringed musical instruments, the cable of a space elevator has a natural resonant frequency. If the cable is excited at this frequency, for example by the travel of elevators up and down it, the vibrational energy could build up to dangerous levels and exceeds the cable's tensile strength. This can be avoided by the use of suitable dampening systems within the cable and by scheduling travel up and down the cable, keeping its resonant frequency in mind. It may even be possible to do dampening against Earth's magnetos magnetosphere. 5.8. In the event of failure. If, despite all these precautions, the elevator is severed anyway, the resulting scenario depends on where exactly the break occurred. 5.8.1 Caught near the anchor point. If the elevator is caught at its anchor point on Earth's surface, the outward force exerted by the counterweight would cause the entire elevator to rise upward into a stable orbit. 
This is because a space elevator must be kept in tension, with greater centrifugal force pulling outward than gravitational force pulling inwards, or any additional payload added to the elevator's bottom end would pull the entire structure down. The ultimate altitude of the severed lower end of the cable would depend on the details of the elevator's mass distribution. In theory, the loose end may be secured and fastened down again. This would be an extremely tricky operation, however, requiring careful adjustment of the cable's center of gravity to bring the cable back down to the surface again at just the right location. It may prove easier to build a new system in such a situation. 5.8.2 Cut at about 25,000 kilometers. If the break occurred at a higher altitude, up to about 25,000 kilometers, the lower portion of the elevator would descend to Earth and drape itself along the equator east of the anchor point, while the now unbalanced upper portion would rise to a higher orbit. Some authors, such as science fiction writers David Gerald in Jumping Off the Planet, Kim Stanley Robinson in Red Mars, and Ben Bova in Mercury, have suggested that such a failure would be catastrophic with the thousands of kilometers of falling cable creating a swath of meteoroidic destruction along Earth's surface. However, in most cable designs, the upper portion of any cable that fell to Earth would burn up in the atmosphere. Additionally, because proposed initial cables, the only ones likely to be broken, have a very low mass, roughly one kilogram per kilometer, and are flat, the bottom portion would likely settle to Earth with less force than a sheet of paper due to air resistance on the way down. If the break occurred at the counterweight site of the elevator, the lower portion, now including the central station of the elevator, would entirely fall down if not prevented by an early self-destruct of the cable shortly below it. Depending on the size, however, it would burn up on re-entry anyway. 5.8.3 Elevator Climbers Any climbers on the falling section would also re-enter Earth's atmosphere but it is likely that the climbers will already have been designed to withstand such an event as an emergency measure. It is almost inevitable that some objects, climbers, structural members, repair crews, etc., will accidentally fall off the elevator at some point. Their subsequent fate would depend upon their initial altitude. Except at geosynchronous altitude, an object on a space elevator is not in a stable orbit, and so its trajectory will not remain parallel to it. The object will instead enter an elliptical orbit, the characteristics of which depend on where the object was on the elevator when it was released. If the initial height of the object falling off the elevator is less than 23,000 kilometers, its orbit will have an epogee at the altitude where it was released from the elevator, and a pedigree within Earth's atmosphere. It will intersect the atmosphere within a few hours, and not complete an entire orbit. Above this critical altitude, the pedigree is above the atmosphere, and the object will be able to complete a full orbit to return to the altitude it started from. By then, the elevator would be somewhere else, but a spacecraft could be dispatched to retrieve the object or otherwise remove it. The lower altitude at which the object falls off, the greater the eccentricity of its orbit. If the object falls off at the geostationary altitude itself, it will remain nearly motionless relative to the elevator just as in conventional orbital flight. At altitudes higher, the object would again be in elliptical orbit, this time with a pedigree at the altitude the object was released from, and an epigee somewhere higher than that. The eccentricity of the orbit would increase with the altitude from which the object was released. Above 47,000 kilometers, however, an object that falls off the elevator would have a velocity greater than the local escape velocity of Earth the object would head out into interplanetary space, and if there were any people present on board, it might prove impossible to rescue them. 5.9. Van Allen Belts The space elevator would run through the Van Allen Belts. This is not a problem for most freight, but the amount of time a climber spends in this region would cause radiation poisoning to any unshielded human or other living things. Some people speculate that passengers and other living things will continue to travel by high-speed rocket, while the space elevator hauls bulk cargo. Research into lightweight shielding and techniques for cleaning out the belts is underway. More conventional and faster atmospheric reentry techniques, such as aerobraking, might be employed on the way down to minimize radiation exposure. Deorbit burns use relatively little fuel and so can be cheap. An obvious option would be for the elevator to carry shielding to protect passengers. 
though this would reduce its overall capacity, of course. Alternatively, the shielding itself could in some cases consist of useful payload, for example, food, water, fuel, or construction and maintenance materials, and no additional shielding costs are then incurred on the way up. To shield passengers from the radiation in the Van Allen belt, perhaps counterintuitively, material composed of light elements should be used, as opposed to lead shielding. In fact, high-energy protons and electrons in the Van Allen belts produce dangerous x-rays when they strike atoms of heavy elements. Materials containing great amounts of hydrogen, such as water, or lightweight plastics, such as polyethylene, are also effective and lighter materials, such as aluminum, are better than heavier ones, such as steel. Such light element shielding, if it were strong enough to protect against the Van Allen particle radiation, would also provide adequate protection against X-ray radiation coming from the sun during solar flares and coronal mass ejection events. Section 6. Economics. With a space elevator, materials might be sent into orbit at a fraction of the current cost. Modern rocketry gives prices that are on the order of thousands of U.S. dollars per kilogram for transfer to low Earth orbit and roughly $20,000 per kilogram for transfer to geosynchronous orbit. For a space elevator, the price could be on the order of a few hundred dollars per kilogram, or possibly much less. Space elevators have high capital cost but low operating expenses, so they make the most economic sense in a situation where it would be used over a long period of time to handle very large amounts of payload. The current launch market may not be large enough to make a compelling case for a space elevator, but a dramatic drop in the price of launching material to orbit would likely result in new types of space activities becoming economically feasible. In this regard, they share similarities with other transportation infrastructure projects, such as highways or railroads. Development costs might be roughly equivalent, in modern dollars, to the cost of developing the shuttle system. A question subject to speculation is whether a space elevator would return the investment, or if it would be more beneficial to instead spend the money on developing rocketry further. Section 7. Political Issues One potential problem with a space elevator would be the issue of ownership and control. Such an elevator would require significant investment Estimates start at five billion U.S. dollars for a very primitive tether, and it would take at least a decade to recoup such expenses. At present, very few entities are able to spend in the space industry at that magnitude. Assuming a multinational governmental effort was able to produce a working space elevator, many political issues would remain to be solved. Which countries would use the elevator, and how often? Who would be responsible for its defense from terrorists or enemy states? A space elevator could potentially cause rifts between states over the military applications of the elevator. Furthermore, establishment of a space elevator would require knowledge of the positions and paths of all existing satellites in Earth orbit, and the removal if they cannot be adequately avoided by the elevator, unless the base station itself can move in order to make the elevator avoid satellites, as proposed by Edwards. An initial elevator could be used in relatively short order to lift the materials to build more such elevators, but the owners of the first elevator might refuse to carry such materials in order to maintain their monopoly. As space elevators, regardless of the design, are inherently fragile but military va militarily valuable structures, they would likely be targeted immediately in any major conflict with a state that controls one. Consequently, most militarists would elect to continue development of conventional rockets or similar launch technologies to provide effective backup methods to access space. The cost of the space elevator is not excessive compared to other projects and is conceivable that several countries or an international consortium could pursue the space elevator. Indeed, there are companies and agencies in a number of countries that have expressed interest in the concept. Generally, Projects on the scale of a space elevator need to either be joint public-private partnership ventures or government ventures, and they involve multiple partners. It is also possible that a private entity, risks notwithstanding, could provide the financing. Several large investment firms have started interest in construction of the space elevator as a private endeavor. The political motivation for a collaborative effort comes from the potential destabilizing nature of the space elevator. The space elevator clearly has military applications, but more critically, it would give a strong economic advantage for the controlling entity. 
information flowing through satellites, future energy from space, planets full of real estate and associated minerals, and basic military advantage could all potentially be controlled by the entity that controls access to the space through the space elevator. An international collaboration could result in multiple elevators at various locations around the globe, since subsequent elevators would be significantly cheaper, thus allowing general access to space and consequently eliminating the instabilities of a single system. Arthur C. Clarke compared the space elevator project to Cirrus Field's efforts to build the first transatlantic telegraph table, quote, the Apollo project of its age, end quote. Section 8, History, 8.1 early concepts. The concept of the space elevator first appeared in 1895 when a Russian scientist, Konstantin Toslovsky, was inspired by the Eiffel Tower in Paris to c consider a tower that reached all the way into space. He imagined placing a celestial castle at the end of a spindle-shaped cable, with the castle orbiting Earth in geosynchronous orbit. In other words, the castle would remain over the same spot on Earth's surface. The tower would be built from the ground up, to an altitude of 35,790 kilometers above mean sea level or geostationary orbit. Comments from Nikola Tesla suggested that he may have also convinced, conceived such a tower. Toslovsky's notes were sent behind the Iron Curtain after his death. Toslovsky's tower would be able to launch objects into orbit without a rocket. Since the elevator would attain orbital velocity as it rode up the cable, an object released at the tower's top would also have the orbital velocity necessary to remain in geosynchronous orbit. 7.2, 20th century. Building from the ground up, however, proved an impossible task. There was no material in existence with enough compressive strength to support its own weight under such conditions. It took until 1957 for another Russian scientist, Yuri Artsutanov, to conceive of a more feasible scheme for building a space tower. Artsutanov suggested using a geosynchronous satellite at the base from which to construct the tower. By using a counterweight, a cable would be lowered from geosynchronous orbit to the surface of Earth while the counterweight was extended from the satellite away from Earth, keeping the center of gravity of the cable motionless relative to the Earth. Artsutanov pr purchased his idea in the Sunday supplement of Komsomlovska Prava in 1960. thickening upwards toward geo. Making a cable over 35,000 kilometers long is a difficult task. In 1966, four American engineers decided to determine what type of material would be required to build a space elevator, assuming it would be a straight cable with no variations in its cross-section. They found that the strength required would be twice that of any existing material, including graphite, quartz, and diamond. In 1975, an American scientist, Jerome Pearson, designed a tapered cross-section that would be better suited to building the elevator. The completed cable would be the thickest at geosynchronous orbit, where the tension was the greatest, and would be the narrowest at the tips to reduce the amount of weight per unit area of cross-section that any point on the cable would have to bear. He suggested using a counterweight that would be slowly extended out to 144,000 kilometers almost half the distance to the moon as the lower section of the elevator was built. Without a large counterweight, the upper portion of the cable would have to be longer than the lower due to the way gravitational and centrifugal forces change with the distance from Earth. His analyses included disturbances such as gravitation of the moon, wind, and moving payloads up and down the cable. The weight of the material needed to build the elevator would have required thousands of space shuttle trips. Although part of the material could be transported up the elevator when a minimum strength strand reached the ground level or could be manufactured from space from asteroidal or lunar ore. In 1977, Hans Moravec published an article called, quote, a non-synchronous orbital skyhook, end quote, in which he proposed a modification of the space elevator idea into a more feasible tether propulsion system. Journal of the American Sciences, Volume 25, October to December 1977. Arthur C. Clarke introduced the concept of a space elevator to a broader audience in his 1978 novel, The Foundations of Paradise. 
in which engineers constructed a space elevator on top of a mountain peak in the fictional island country of Taprobani, which is actually an earlier name for Sri Lanka. 8.3 21st Century David Smitherman of NASA slash Marshall's Advanced Projects Office has compiled plans for such an elevator that could turn science fiction into reality. His publication, Space Elevators, an Advanced Earth Space Infrastructure for the New Millennium, is based on findings from a space infrastructure conference held at the Marshall Space Flight Center in 1999. Another American scientist, Bradley C. Edwards, suggests creating a 100,000 kilometer of surviving impacts by meteors. The work of Edwards has expanded to cover the deployment scenario, climber design, power delivery system, orbital debris avoidance, anchor system, surviving atomic oxygen, avoiding lightning and hurricanes by locating the anchor in the western equatorial Pacific, construction costs, construction schedule, and environmental hazards. Plans are currently being made to complete engineering developments, material development, and begin construction of the first elevator. Funding to date has been through a grant from NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts. Future funding is sought from through NASA and the United States Department of Defense, private and public sources. The largest holdup to Edwards' proposed design is the technological limits of the tether material. His calculations call for a fiber composed of epoxy-bonded carbon nanotubes with a minimal tensile strength of 130 gigapascals. However, tests in 2000 of individual single-walled chain carbon nanotubes, SWCNTs, which should be notably stronger than an epoxy-bounded rope, indicated that the strongest measurement was 52 gigapascals. Multi-walled carbon nanotubes have been measured with tensile strengths up to 63 gigapascals. Space elevator proponents are planning competitions for space elevator technologies, similar to Ansari's X Prize. Elevator 2010 will organize annual competitions for climbers, ribbons, and power being systems. The Robo Olympics Space Elevator Ribbon Climbing organizes climber robot building competitions. In March of 2005, NASA's Centennial Challenges program announced a partnership with the SpaceWord Foundation, the operator of Elevator 2010, raising the total value of prizes to 400,000 US dollars. On 27 April 2005, the Liftport Group of Space Elevator Companies has announced that it will be building a carbon nanotube manufacturing plant in Millville, New Jersey, to supply various glass, plastic, and metal companies with these strong materials. Although Liftport hopes to eventually use carbon nanotubes in the construction of a 100,000 kilometer, 62,000 mile space elevator, this move will allow it to make money in the short term and conduct research and development into new production methods. On 9 September, the group announced that they had obtained permission from the Federal Aviation Administration to use airspace to conduct preliminary tests of its high-altitude robotic lifters. The experiment was successful. On February 13, 2006, the Liftport Group announced that, earlier that same month, they had tested a mile of space elevator tether made of carbon fiber made of carbon fiber composite strings and fiberglass tape measuring 5 centimeters wide and 1 millimeter, approximately 6 sheets of paper thick, lifted with balloons. See also Space Elevator in Fiction Space Elevator Economics, which discusses cap capital and maintenance costs of a space elevator, and Lunar Space Elevator for the Moon variant. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.